in a series called Habits of Growth, Understanding and Practicing the Spiritual Disciplines. And today we are going to look at the discipline of serving. Now over the past several weeks, we've been on a journey of understanding the spiritual disciplines. If you remember, I've been telling you that the spiritual disciplines in and of themselves are not the goal. Our goal is godliness. We're, we're using this as a pathway, as a channel to get to know our Lord better, to follow him with uh, more passion, with the sense of being able to grow in our own godliness. Of course, that is completely dependent upon the Holy Spirit. We are dependent on the Spirit leading us and guiding us, but yet we use the spiritual disciplines as a method to, uh, to that particular end. And if you remember, we started by looking at the first spiritual discipline of worship, and that's what we just got done doing collectively as a congregation just now, but it's also something we've learned that it continues throughout our time, our, our day, as, as individuals in the personal presence of, of God. We said that's where it starts. It starts with worship. Then we moved into Bible reading, and we started working through a simple plan of just reading the Scriptures repetitively. Many of you are doing that. You're working through First John and that 30-day journey of understanding it. And the desire of our hearts when we read the Scripture is simply to understand what it says. It's just to kind of have an understand, broad-based understanding. Here's what the Scriptures are saying. But then we move from reading to study. That's when we seek to understand its meaning. And we go to the next depth of uh, seeking to understand. What is this in the context of the entire breadth of Scripture? What does this mean? And then how do I apply it? Last week we looked at fasting and prayer, and today now we're going to look at the idea of service. You know, when you look at most books on the spiritual disciplines, when they begin to talk about the idea of service, they approach it from the idea of motive. Their focus is on the motive behind service. I looked at a number of books on the spiritual disciplines. It looked like they were all taking the same tack. They wanted to motivate me to serve. And so they were concerned about why I serve and the benefits of the serving and the reasons behind serving. I don't know about you, but I find that every time someone gives me a reason why I should do something, I don't, maybe it's my just own sinful nature, I can come up with as many reasons why I shouldn't do something. You ever find yourself that way? I actually think if we enter into the concept of service, we start our study with the idea of motive, it's actually gonna be counterproductive for you. You might actually be sitting there saying, well, I can't do that, I don't have time for that. Or there might be a barrier, well, I don't know how to do that, so uh, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in, in giving my time to that. Or, or perhaps it's a desire, I don't really wanna do that. You know, there's all kinds of barriers that we can put up that would squash the idea of motive. So I'm not gonna go, I think that's a counterproductive, I'm not gonna go that direction. I'm gonna focus on something completely differently when it comes to the idea of service. I want to focus on our identity. You see, if we understand our identity, who we are, who Christ has made us, the question of service no longer becomes a question. But it's moving us into a clear understanding of our identity that is necessary. So I'm going to take you on a journey that's a little bit different this morning. I'm going to ask that you follow along with me. It's not going to necessarily be an easy journey, but Nonetheless, it'll be a clarifying journey that relates to our identity. I mean, what is it? What is our identity entity? When, when it regards to service, what's our identity have to do with it in the first place? I was looking uh, this week at a bookstore, and it happened to have a large Christian section, and I started perusing the titles. And I noticed there were very few books that would lead me to understand God, understand who he is, understand what he's done in my life, understand how I ought to relate to him. Rather, all of these titles that seem to be kind of parading themselves before me on the shelves, which really speaking about identity. And it was the idea behind who I ought to think I am. Uh, I was looking at titles that uh, had more to do with my personal freedoms or my relationships or my fulfillment or my purposes than really what I felt as a biblical call to clarity in our identity. I then went home that evening and I thought, you know, if, if, if this is the way it is in, in the marketplace of the top 
Christian selling books. I wonder what's going on in the pulpits today. And so I started doing a search. What, what are pastors teaching about? What are some of the sermon titles? And I found several titles that I thought illustrated a similar mindset. For example, here was a, a title being preached even uh, as we speak. It's a series called Discovering Your Life Purpose. The whole series was really focused in who you are and what your purpose should be and ought to be. Another one was a pathway to personal happiness. Here's one called how to get what you really want out of life. You realize that once you understand your identity, all of, uh, of these seem to be irrelevant. You don't need to have an outside source speak into your identity or to help you find your life purpose. Your life purpose has actually been given for you through the Word of God. What I want to do is actually help you understand that identity and see it in, in, in a much more clear, even critical way, perhaps in ways you've never thought of before. To do that, I want to have you come with me to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. Now, I'm going to start here because this is a familiar passage. Not only have we as a congregation gone through this passage on several occasions, but I think it will have a ring of familiarity for you personally. But it's at that moment that we become the most dangerous to the Word of God, when the Word of God becomes familiar. I'm going to ask that you try to move past the familiarity of the passage and think of it almost as a whole new level. I'm in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5, 6, and 7. Paul is writing about our identity. He says this in verse 5, have this mind among yourselves. So right away, he's being didactic. He's teaching us. He says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to be careful about what you're to hear, and I want you to have this mind as your own. All right, Paul, what kind of mind do you want us to have? Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So he's saying, I want you to have the mind of Christ. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a what? Say it. Servant. Now, when you look at the passage, you might almost immediately say, all right, well, this is pretty clear. My identity, according to Scripture, is that of a servant. I mean, it's right here in the text. It's not only here, but it's in dozens of places throughout the New Testament that here we're called, we're proclaimed to be the same mindset of Christ. And what was the mindset of Christ? That of a servant. I think we might all agree on that, but what if at this point I told you that you were wrong? That's not the identity that the Scriptures are proclaiming to you. The Scripture is not saying that you ought to be a servant. I actually think that this passage is a bit misleading because the word servant doesn't even mean servant. When you hear the word servant, you probably have a certain picture in your mind of what a servant is. A servant is someone who serves. A servant is someone who obeys another, someone who works for another. What if I told you that is not the actual word of the text? The actual word is very specific in the New Testament, especially when it comes to the New Testament Greek. It is the word doulos. And the word doulos has a different meaning than servant. It actually means slave. Let me give you the definition of the word doulos. A slave, one who is in permanent relation of servitude to another, his will being altogether consumed in the will of the other. Generally, one serving or bound to serve or in bondage. Immediately, you probably are starting to see the difference between the idea of a servant, which we see portrayed in the text, and the word slave. You see, the translators of the English Standard Version, which is the version I'm using today, has taken the word doulos, which means slave, and like in many of your versions, has translated it servant. Remember what is the point behind the passage. We are to have the same mindset of Christ, that means it's incredibly important for us to have clarity. Well, what is the mindset of Christ? Is it of a servant or is it of a slave? 
Let's go a little bit deeper in our study. What identity did Paul assume for himself when he became a Christ follower? You don't have to go far. Come with me to Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, and you see Paul identifying himself in a very clear way. Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul includes Timothy in this, and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Now, in my particular Bible, I actually have a footnote behind the word servant. I look down at the bottom of the page, and sure enough, it clarifies it does not mean servant. It means doulos. It means slave. So in the literal language of the New Testament, Paul says that he is a slave of Christ. Now let's make sure this is not an anomaly. Let's come over to Romans chapter one and let's see if Paul introduces himself in similar fashions there. Romans chapter one, verse one. I'm gonna have you turning quite a bit, so you might as well get ready. Romans one, one. Next we're going to Galatians 1, 10. Romans 1, one, here again, Paul begins his letter and notice how he identifies himself. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now go back to the word servant in our English translations. Again, mine has a footnote. I go down to the bottom of the footnote, and what is the footnote? It identifies that this word servant actually is the word doulos, which means slave. So in the literal language of the scripture, what is Paul saying? Paul is saying, I am a slave of Christ. Now I told you I'd go to Galatians. This is going to be as well an idea of clarification. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Now we have this word in context. Paul's not only identifying who he is and his identity, but he sees it in relation to how he relates with the rest of the world. So very important, now we really get to the heart of matter of what Paul thinks of himself. He says in verse 10, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a slave of Christ. The word might be translated servant in your Bible. It is the word doulos. We already know the meaning of that word, slave. He now identifies himself, he calls himself, it's his own personal title, he is a slave of Christ. I was wondering when I started working through Paul's if the other apostles might feel the same way. So come with me to the book of James, James chapter one. Since Paul wrote most of the New Testament, it's always good to have somewhat of a balance to understand, well, what do some of the other writers of the New Testament feel about a certain tub, uh, subject. This is certainly one of them I'd be fascinated with. So James chapter one, first one. Now you gotta remember who James is. James is the half-brother of Jesus. He's also the leader over the church in Jerusalem. He has a fairly significant position. You would think that as he would start his letter, he might mention that. He might lean into the idea that he's the Lord's half-brother or that he is the leader over the church established at the moment. He doesn't say any of that. Notice how he introduces himself. James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word servant in your New Testament English editions is the word doulos, it is the word slave. What is he literally saying? He is saying, I am James, and how you can identify me is a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. One more, let's look to see how Peter identifies himself. I'm in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Again, what do we see? Here's Peter, well-known follower of Christ, personal friend, what does he say of himself? Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. The word servant in your English translation, again, is the word doulos, translated slave. So here we have Paul, Timothy, James, Peter, all referring to themselves as not servants, 
but slaves. Now you might stop right here and think, you know, what's the big difference? We're talking about just a small difference between the word servant and slave. Really? Well, let's study this idea of, the, uh, of, of servant because the New Testament has a number of words it uses to define what a servant is and does. To be uh, clear, there's at least six, possibly as many as eight different Greek words to help us understand what the New Testament culture meant when it said servant went to the Erdman's Dictionary of the Bible, looked up the word servant, here is what it says. A person employed or otherwise bound to serve and discharge duties for another. Many servants mentioned in the Bible are clearly not slaves, but in a form of dependent labor different from actual chattel slavery. Do you hear what Erdman's is saying? It's saying that when it comes to understanding the culture of a servant during biblical times is not necessarily that of a slave. In fact, I would go so far as to say it is not that of a slave at all. You look at all the six words, in fact, here are the six words, diakonos, which means deacon, or a one who serves as a deacon. Oikates comes from the word oikes, house, is a house servant. Pace means man servant. Upertes means a low-level servant or under rower, one who's hired into a navy, for example. There's also words for religious servant, sanctuary worker. Out of the six words that the New Testament uses for servant, not one of them is doulos. When the word doulos is used, it is used exclusively in the New Testament to mean slave. It is not translated in its culture as servant, but always as slave. So in other words, if you read the New Testament in its original language, you begin to see a different definition for our, our identity. It does not call us servants. It calls us slaves. To help you understand this even more, the King James Version, the New King James Version, the New American Standard Bible, the the ESV, English Standard Version, which I'm using, the NIV, all have translated doulos, not as slave, but as servant. And my question is, why? Why the change? I mean, clearly the word doulos appears multiple times, 130 times throughout the New Testament. It is not an ambiguous term by any means. When it is used, it means what it means. It means slave, not servant. It's interesting to note that in the King James Version, doulos, which is used 130 times, is never translated slave. It is always translated servant. When you go to the New King James Version, 130 times you find the word doulos. It is only translated 18 times as slave. In my own favorite translation, the ESV, I was interested in what, what its translation percentage was. 130 times, the words uh, doulos appears in the ESV, only 17 times do they translate it slave. All the other times, servant. Almost all English translations have virtually eliminated the word slave. Why? Why would the English translators avoid such an important term to help us clarify our identity? One writer said this, it is not a lack of linguistic information. We have plenty of linguistic information on how we should define this word. He goes on to say, perhaps it's a lack of courage. What he means is that slavery represents a very negative connotation, a very negative situation in our land. In our English-speaking culture, the idea of a slave does not have any sense of virtue whatsoever. Servant, on the other hand, is one who's hired to work for a payment. It's not so bad to be a servant. You're a servant, you're doing work that actually receives a payment for your services, and you can quit at any time. 
A slave, on the other hand, is owned. They have no rights. In fact, if they escape, quit, they can be arrested, punished, flogged, even put to death. So is the case of one New Testament book that has almost everything to do with the institution of slavery culturally in the New Testament. If you go to the small little book of Philemon, you find out there was a runaway slave called Onesimus. And Onesimus leaves his master, runs away, and in the providence of God, this runaway slave happens to meet the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul engages a conversation with him, leads him to Christ. Throughout additional conversation, discovers that his new brother in Christ actually is a friend, has is an acquaintance of a friend of his, his slave owner, Philemon. Paul says to Onesimus, I know who your owner is. You can't run away from him. It's not right. You have to go back to him. And what does Onesimus say? There's no way I'm going to go back to him. He could take my life. Literally, he could take his life as a runaway slave. He understood the danger of that. Paul said, I'm going to write a letter for you. And so he writes Philemon and says, I want you to be careful with our brother Onesimus. Treat him well. Why did Paul have to go to such extenuating circumstances? Because he knew the danger that Onesimus was in as a slave during that particular time. And what was the point that Onesimus was not a servant, he is and was a slave? You have to wonder why it is that we avoid this concept biblically. It's much easier to call yourself a servant of Christ than a slave of Christ. In fact, it's much easier all throughout the process of understanding and living out the gospel. Speaking of the gospel, can you imagine presenting the gospel in this format? Would you like today to become a slave of Jesus Christ? We don't hear that, do we? Why don't you consider giving up all of your rights, all of your independence, all of your personal freedom, willingly become an indentured servant owned and controlled by Jesus Christ? Would you like to make him your master today? We don't use that terminology. As Americans, we have somewhat of a repugnant view of anything that even comes close to slavery not only because of our own horrid history of its practice, but we understand the reality of slavery even happening in our day and time. And so what do we do as men and women of justice? We fight against such things. Why would we want to capitulate to a concept or a word? Perhaps that is why our New Testament translators have translated the word doulos, slave, to servant. But you have to also understand that the Roman Greek world would have not been much different than our own. They too would have seen slavery as repugnant if they were a free man. Now according to what we find in history, estimated 15 million slaves existed during the Greek-Roman era. So they only had an issue with slavery when it came to their own personal freedom. Remember, Rome valued freedom above all things. They wanted freedom to move throughout all regions, and, if you, and everyone wanted to be a Roman. Why? Because they were a free man. And there was nothing more repugnant to a free man than to become an enslaved man. But yet they had no rights. They had, they could not own, slaves could not have ownership. They could not have legal entitlement over anything. They could not have citizenship. And the Roman man or woman would want nothing to do with personally being a slave, but they had no problem owning slaves. The slaves of that culture would have understood the horrors and the difficulties of like any other culture that participates in slavery. Yet, nonetheless, I bring this up, because Scripture has no problem whatsoever calling free men and women to be slaves of Christ. You would think they too would want to move away from what, such verbiage, but they don't. They embrace it. 
Let me show you this with some clarity. Come with me to two passages. First in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter six. Ephesians chapter six. I'm going to be in verses five and six. Now I bring you here because at this point in Paul's writing to the Ephesian, he actually addresses those who are slaves. So he's not speaking metaphorically, he's speaking realistically. Here are a group of people who have become followers of Christ, they are slaves themselves, they are not free, and he addresses them. Which by the way, the scriptures are not attempting, nor was it the aim of the writers of scripture, to eradicate slavery from its culture. It was simply speaking into the culture of that particular time that had engaged in slavery. So Paul is writing to slaves and he says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. He's telling them how they ought to act. So this is how you go about being an honorable slave. It might be a terrible situation, but here's how you honor Christ in your terrible situation. You treat your masters with great sincerity, with fear and trembling, you listen to them. Not by, the way, not by way of eye service, in other words, just so everyone else can see, or as people pleasers, but as, notice this, servants of Christ. Now, if you were reading in the the original language, he would have spoken of a doulos, a slave, and then he would have used the same word, now in more of a metaphorical term, as a doulos of Christ. He says, you're not only a slave physically, but you are a doulos of Christ. You are a slave of Christ. Doesn't shy away from the word whatsoever. Now come with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let me help you see the parallel passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I actually want to back up. I want to start in verse 17. I'll tell you why. Verse 17 sets the context. Paul is going to address the reality of life. And he doesn't want anyone to make an excuse. Well, I can't become a Christ follower because I'm such and such. Or I can't become a Christ follower because I have not done yet such and such. And so he sets this up and he says, verse 17, only let each person lead the life the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. And he gives two examples. He says, if you happen to be among the circumcised, you don't have to become uncircumcised, that would be impossible, to become a follower of Christ. Second example, if you are a slave, you don't have to become a free man, which would be impossible, to become a follower of Christ. You see where he's going. He uses two examples to his point. But it's interesting that he chooses slavery. Now drop down to verse 22. We'll see this in light of what we're talking about. Verse 22, he says, For he who was called in the Lord, in other words, he who's come, become a believer, as a slave is a, is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was freed when called is a slave of Christ. He actually gives us now a name to our identity. He quantifies our identity as a follower of Christ with clarity. He calls us slaves of Christ. He says you were bought with a price. Now he even uses the terminology and imagery of slavery. He says you were Bought. How was a slave, slave transferred from one slave owner to the next? They were purchased. They were put up on the slave block. They were purchased. That's the whole imagery that Paul is using in this particular incident. He says, you are a slave of Christ. Do you see the importance of clarifying Scripture? Because what we have here is it clarifies our identity. Why is our identity essential when we're seeking to understand how we interact with Christ? If we do not understand who we are, we cannot understand then how to go about following this one we call Lord, which is, ironically, he calls himself our masters. If he's our master, what are we? We are his slaves. Now, just in case you're confused, I want to make this 
very clear. Our identity is not of a servant. You see, a servant is one who has a choice to serve. The identity of the New Testament believer is that of a slave we're bound to serve. Now we're talking about something completely different. We're not talking about the right motives behind service. I don't have to work you up. I don't have to tell you why. I don't have to cajole you or pull you into service. It's part of our identity. It's who we are. We are by nature slaves of Christ. Therefore, because we're slaves of Christ, we serve him. Now, you might have a very sour taste in your mouth, and rightfully so, probably at this point. You might be thinking, you know, when you put it that way, I have no joy in the sense of my service. It feels like I'm just this indentured, forced slave. I have no other choice in the matter. I want to remind you at this point not to forget who the master is. That makes all the difference in the world. You see, we've been bound, the scripture tells us, to a slave master that was cruel and wanted nothing more than to lead us to hell. It was the slave master of sin. In parallel, we have been presented with a master who is anything but a tyrant leading us into hell, but all the more a righteous, gracious, kind, loving, good master who wants far beyond for us than we can ever imagine. You want to see it? It's actually detailed in the book of Romans chapter 6. In Romans 6, we see the struggle between the two masters, the horrid master of sin that has locked us in to a slavery that we could never free ourselves from in comparison to a master who has willfully paid a price that we might be his. I'm in Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Listen to it carefully. Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Here it is, verse 18. And have been set free from sin, and you have become slaves of righteousness. Drop down to verse 20. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. In other words, you didn't have to worry about a righteous lifestyle. You were in bondage to sin. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things which you were now ashamed? The end of those things is death. In other words, the very end of your indentured slavehood is death. But Verse 22, now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit get, that leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. What? Your master gives you what? Gives you not death, but gives you eternal life. Did you see what the text is saying? We were once slaves of the greatest of all tyrants of taskmasters that was leading you to hell, but what has the master done? This new master has set you free from the bondage of sin. Verse 18. And not only has he set you free from the bondage of sin, how did he do it? He bought you with a price, 1 Corinthians 6.20. He bought you. We are owned and purchased by the master. And what was the purchase price? Was it something as simple as gold and silver as commonly used on the blocks of every slave trader across the world? No. What did he do? The precious blood of the master was spilled so that we might be ransomed. That's actually the word that the scriptures use. You were ransomed. It says this, for by his blood he ransomed people for God. From every tribe and language, from people and nation, he, have made, he has made them a kingdom and a priest to our God, and they shall reign on earth. What, what kind of slavery is this? 
Is this the type of slavery you're thinking of? I mean, what master turns his slaves into reigning priests over a kingdom that yet he's about ready to establish? What slave master then says, oh, you're not slaves, I've made you priests, and you're not priests, John 15, 15, I've now called you friend. And if you want to take it one more, he not only calls you friend, Galatians 3, 26, he now calls you sons of God. He is not ashamed, Hebrews 2, 11, to call us brothers. You see, you have to put this in the mindset of our identity. Scripture is speaking of a great identity that you and I now have been purchased into. A slave that has been ransomed by the master's blood, bought with a price, made to be a kingdom of priests to our God, was one day is going to reign on earth, is no longer called slave but friend, is elevated from friend to brother, is now sons and daughters of God, is a slave who never forgets where he comes from. You see, that's the point. When you understand the identity that you are a slave of Christ purchased by none other than Jesus himself, what more motivation do you need to serve him? You see, I can seek to motivate you, but I think in our own dark recesses of our heart, we can come up with as many motives, motivations not to serve him. But when you move the heart to being captured, redeemed, ransomed, purchased, bought, so that you might become his own person, people of his own, that's a whole another concept. Now my broken heart wants nothing more than to do what? to serve him. My heart wants nothing more to hear. Isn't it what we want to hear? Matthew 25, 23, well done, good and faithful doulos, slave. Look it up. It's the cry of the human heart that has been redeemed by Christ to hear our master say well done. You serving? It's part of your identity. You see, if you are not involved in the spiritual discipline of serving the master, you've missed your identity. There are a plethora of opportunities in the church of Jesus Christ, its parachurches, and the community around us to be a force outside of our own desires that follows only the desires of the master, Jesus Christ. Are you in that? Are you in that vein? Are you in that service? It's who you are. It's who God made you to be. It's your identity. Let's bow our heads. Let's go to the Lord. This was not easy to hear, nor is it easy to always rectify in our minds, to clarify an identity of something that can have such a negative connotation in its overall meaning, yet it is required, it is the text, it is the identity scripture gives us. Have you assumed that in of yourself? Can I lead you in prayer to ask that question? Father, have I considered my identity as your slave? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would break into the very recesses of this concept and move it from an idea, knowledge, that which we come to understand into action. May we experience over and over again the abundant joy of being owned 
And then the outpouring of that joy by following after and serving you. For those here who have struggled with finding the time or the desire or the method or the how, may that dissipate into this longing of the soul to live out their identity. Oh God, and then may there be that surprising realization that when we do, when we actually do live by our calling, the joy that comes, the purpose that comes, the fulfillment that comes, all that we search for is there, provided by you. And may that be our experience. We wait for you to do that. Move our hearts, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. This has been a message from The Chapel in Akron, Ohio. For more information about The Chapel or to listen to more of these types of life-applicable messages, please go to our website at thechapel.life.